Good morning on this Sunday, March 24th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. The father of murdered nursing student Lakin Riley appears before lawmakers pleading with them to take action against illegal immigrants. Also, the Fulton County judge in the election interference case gives the defense permission to appeal his decision that allows DA Fonnie Willis and her team to stay on the case. And state lawmakers look to tackle prison reform after reports Georgia's system is in crisis. Melita, Phil, Theron, and Janelle are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. This week, the Georgia Senate pushed through two bills aimed at forcing local governments to help deport illegal immigrants instead of sheltering them. The action comes after the father of Lake and Riley made a plea to senators. God gave me a beautiful daughter to father, protect, provide for, and nurture. A man with an evil heart stole her life. He was in this country and in this state illegally. My vision for every senator in this chamber is that you protect citizens from this illegal invasion. The father of Lake and Riley urged senators to take action. The nursing student was killed while jogging on the campus of UGA. Investigators say her killer, Jose Ibarra, was in the country illegally. Her family is devastated. That could have been prevented. One of the bills passed in the Senate creates penalties for sheriffs and jailers who don't contact federal officials to check prisoners' immigration status. Republican State Senator John Elber says this bill was years in the making and not a knee-jerk reaction after the murder of Riley. Democrats say the legislation would lead to unintended consequences and be tough to enforce. This is a public safety issue, make no mistake, and it specifically deals with criminals. Is it just to punish thousands of other men, women, and children whose only connection to the crime is a shared immigration status with the perpetrator? Now, another bill passed by the Senate this week would punish cities and counties that supporters say are illegally harboring immigrants by cutting off most state aid to the local government and removing elected officials from office. Um, let's start with you, Janelle, this week on this topic. Yeah, um, so just the whole watching this, the Lake and Riley, everything that's happened, I think has evoked a lot of emotions within all of us, right? I think we're, we're looking at this and we're seeing it for what it is. Um, to see his, her father go up there and have to advocate for his child and, uh, and children of all across the state of Georgia is it's it's sad but at the same time I'm glad that we're increasing this discussion um, this is something that I know Governor Kent ran on in his first term on you know making sure that we kind of move the illegal immigrants out of out of Georgia so we have to get back to, to that and get back to focusing on that um, but I am wondering how this is going to affect the conversations on campus around the border because a lot of students on campus are in support of some of these policies that are allowing this to happen. So I wonder um, if this is going to change that. Theron, um, this issue is not going away. It's going to go all the way into November. Um, now you have you know, the family of Lake and Riley speaking out mm -hmm. against illegal immigration. So how do you think this will impact the, the race going forward? I agree with Janelle. I mean, when seeing that image and being at the Capitol that day with the father of Lake and Riley went to the Senate and basically pleaded to uh, pass his bill. But I also saw him in an earlier interview, I think on the NBC, mm -hmm. where he literally said, let's not politicize the death of my daughter, meaning like, you know, let's not use this as a political sort of football on either side to try to, you know, make her death uh, all about politics. But if you listen to the tone of what he said, he's just really pushing for making sure that there are laws in place to make sure that people who are out on the streets who have a you know a record of crime who are here uh, as illegally that they actually are working with law enforcement that's the key working with local law enforcement to make sure that these these people who commit crimes are documented and it's, it is clearly if they need to be in jail they should stay in jail and if they're released that the local authorities actually have a reason why and so yeah this is not going to go away but the one thing i would say is this lori you know, I'm from Athens. I keep mm -hmm. up with it. My mom definitely watches this show and keeps me honest. But let's just talk about There's been a lot of other things that's happened in Athens. We all saw the story about the three-year-old who was shot 
uh, in the house and it was gang related. And I implored the district attorney, Deborah Gonzalez, to treat that case and the death of Lake and Riley with the same amount of enthusiasm. But I didn't really see the outrage. I didn't see the text messages. I didn't see a run to the Capitol to do something about the gang problem that we have. And then and you had this three year old who was shot by a straight bullet. So again, if we're going to be against <laughs> violence and we're going to be against bad people, including gang members and illegal immigrants who the Republicans say are here committing crimes, I just want that same amount of enthusiasm coming out of Athens for all people and all families who are experiencing what the Riley family is experiencing. Phil, um, are there laws already on the books that just aren't being enforced? Is that the issue here? Um, Lake and Riley's alleged murderer may never have been able to stay in the country if those laws were enforced, or does the state legislature, does Georgia need to get involved? Well, both. Uh, there are some laws on the books. For example, uh, the disgrace of these sanctuary jurisdictions uh, are supposed to be banned by law in the Georgia Code, but there's no enforcement mechanism. And that's why, sadly, you do have to use the political system. I know that uh, the Riley family is grieving, and but there has to be politics involved. And that's why, Lori, you do have these two laws that we're talking about. One, we needed because uh, we've got to have an enforcement mechanism and we've got to penalize a jurisdiction like athens Clark County, who's got one one of the worst DAs uh, in the state because she actually absolutely says she's not for the death penalty. She wouldn't prosecute that. And I think Lake and Riley's murderer deserves the death penalty, in my opinion. But uh, also, uh, there's a second law which is badly needed, and that's to hold people responsible like sheriffs and jailers uh, because we've got at least 12 sheriffs uh, that will not hand over criminals to the feds. Now, we've got this open border, thanks to Biden. We're letting in who knows what, but we do know we're letting in violent criminals, and yet you've got sheriffs that won't turn over violent criminals to the feds and ICE for a detainer. That's got to stop, and that's why one of these bills was passed to penalize counties like Clark County. What about this issue, Melita, of holding these sheriffs and other local officials accountable to the laws? Well, I think it's an appropriate thing to, to hold sheriffs accountable to the law, but what we have to remember is that we're taking this tragedy and politicizing it. And many studies have found that immigrants are less likely to be arrested for violent crimes than um, citizens born here. Mm -hmm. And so this issue is being used to fan hatred, fan fear, and fan undue concerns. And at the same time, just as Theron mentioned the gangs, the day before Lake and Riley um, was murdered, there was a student who died of suicide. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about mental health funding. We're not talking about improving mm -hmm. the um, awareness about suicide prevention. In fact, Republicans stripped a bill, which we'll get to later, on that very subject. I find it interesting you said undue concerns, but this is a very much so a, a, a major concern. Um, I, I think it's important to note that Yes, there are other crimes that are taking place. In every country, there are crimes. That's why we have a legal system and we have police officers and people that are supposed to handle that. But what we shouldn't have to deal with is crimes that are coming from people who are not citizens. That's the problem here, is that we're dealing with a, a young woman who was murdered by someone who was not supposed to be in this country. And it was politicized before the death. It was politicized when we were trying to call on the federal government to do something about the border before we got to this point. So I do think that it's important to know that we're not politicizing Rake, Lake and Riley. What's being politicized is the inability for the federal government to do what they need to do in order to protect the people in this country. So we've talked about on the show for weeks now about the Republicans' inability, all right, to work. Hold on, no, I didn't cut you off. I didn't say anything. No, no, I know you start shaking your head. I just shook my I, head. Can, I can see you ramping up. <laughs> Yeah, look, let me be very clear. I have come on this show now for three to four weeks and expressed tremendous amount of remorse and understanding and sympathy to the Lake and Riley family, all right? So no one is no one is going against what happened. And if I was a father, I would be doing the same thing. I mean, I am a father, but if that was my daughter or my son, I would be doing the same thing. I don't want to speak for Melita, but I think what we're saying, Janelle, is that there's also been a Republican responsibility to work with this president to deal with the crisis, and I'm calling it a crisis at the border. And so, so the, the timing of it, and it's been reported, pundits talked about this, it happened, unfortunately, where Republicans who had been talking about it could use this death, this unfortunate death, as a reason for them to run back to the Capitol and, and introduce legislation. All I'm saying is, let's continue to match that same amount of enthusiasm with the gang problem that we have, and also the gun problem. No one is talking about, we've had four 
Georgia State students, four Georgia State students that have been shot in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and so much so that a racetrack had to train. I mean, like, there's no. We talked about that. Oh, no, we, no, we have. We do talk about it. No, no, the legislature, these 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 Republicans particularly, and nothing wrong. Well, with the parents people. of the killed, killed, the children that are being killed should go and say something. Well, and it they doesn't. Too. Do, let me play devil's advocate because yeah. that's what I like to do. But doesn't at some point the president, the buck stops with him? Why can't he bring Republicans right. and Democrats together to get a deal done? He, Executive order. He, he, he is trying. Point. He is trying. He is. Uh, if Martha was go here, ahead. she would tell you that it was a deal that was worked in the House. We've tried to do an executive order. He said, "Give me the authority well, to pass a bill." Finally, okay, finally. You said there was nothing left over. Let's clarify what you're saying. There is a bill. However, bills. your people, the Democrats, are blocking people on both sides of the aisle of good faith from doing a piece by piece reform of our broken immigration system. That does has to be done. We all, we all agree on that. However, the hard left always throws in mass amnesty. Well, the American people are sick of mass amnesties. We've had six rolling amnesties since 1986 at least that bring in millions of people and uh, that's got to stop. And right. so the president has, could do anything and you know this but you don't tell the viewers this, he could stop this today with executive orders sealing the border. Congress doesn't need to do a darn thing. Well, we've been talking well, about this let for Melita, two years. Let Melita go. Well, but the, the federal legislation that the Biden administration has begged for is being held hostage by Republicans who want to use it as a tool in November. Well, we've been talking about this for two years. I'm glad that Democrats have finally jumped on board. I'm glad you're finally calling it a crisis because for the law, last two years, you were saying there was nothing wrong, there's nothing to see here, the border is fine. So uh, finally, you're now jumping on board. So thank you. All right, well, I got to wrap it there. And I wanted to talk about, you know, the fact that there was no surprise lawmakers sent Georgia's school voucher bill to Governor Brian Kemp for his signature, but we've discussed that <laughs> several weeks, so <laughs> we'll just move on. And coming up, the judge in the 2020 election interference case says the defense can go ahead and appeal his decision to allow DA Fonnie Willis to stay on the case. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee has granted the defense's request in the Georgia election interference case to appeal his decision that allows DA Fonnie Willis and her team to stay on the case. Now that special prosecutor Nathan Wade has resigned. Phil, does the f defense have a, a legitimate case here? I've talked to a lot of defense attorneys. You all have heard me, uh, both Democrat and Republican, and this is a very appealable decision. And you laugh, mm -hmm. but I think there's a great chance that the judge's original decision will be overturned. Why? Because uh, Fonnie Willis, the DA, and her special prosecutor and lover, Nathan Wade, were two peas in the pod. And the whole process and mess started when the DA hired on uh, Wade. And so why is the judge as I said last week, and I was quoting Jonathan Turley, uh, a Fox commentator, why is the judge uh, uh, kind of looking at the situation like two bank robbers that were caught, but only one goes to jail? So I think that even in the judge's original order, he plainly says there was illegality committed. So I think it'll be overturned. Melita, um, this time last week when we were taping, we surmised that Nathan Wade was going to resign, but we didn't know that for sure. So your thoughts on this defense tactic? Well, I, I think... I think it was appropriate for him to resign, um, and I think that now we'll have a spotlight, a very unaccustomed spotlight, on the 15-member Court of Appeals, because they're not accustomed to being in the center of national attention. That court has 10 men, five women, and five divisions, so it'll be very interesting to see what they do. They will have... Um, the defendants have 10 days to file the appeal. They will have 45 days to accept or reject the appeal. So this accomplishes what the defense has been wanting all along. Delays to the case, distraction from the felonies their defendants face when the case does proceed. But Judge McBurney is holding on to continuing to process motions in the case while this appeal takes place. He did not issue a stay. And then the other thing is that there are other 
court decisions in other jurisdictions which will impact when this case can go to trial. Okay, it's Judge McAfee, by the way. Yeah, Judge McAfee. However, the other side is trying to speed it up before the election so they can try to nail Trump, so that's election interference. All right, I gotta move on because I really wanna get to this topic. Democrats got extremely close to moving Medicaid expansion out of committee, but fell one vote shy. About a half a million uninsured Georgians would be eligible for coverage under the program, but in the end, Republicans rejected the idea. Theron, the committee chairman said he wanted to give Governor Kemp's Pathways plan more time. Wow, so I gotta give a, <laughs> My uh, phone was blowing up. Okay, I have to can say. I give you a little credit with yes, that? That's fine. Okay, good. All right, that's fine. Okay, good. So I get this text message from D. Lori Geary uh, <laughs> while we're at the Capitol, and everyone in all the lobbies, we're trying to get ready for the committee meetings, and uh, surprisingly, that in the regulated industries, I mean, the Senate version uh, of the regulated industry, uh, everyone just starts scrambling the Capitol because we hear that there's gonna be an attempt uh, to introduce a bill that was dropped, I think, a month earlier uh, by Senator David Lucas uh, to basically uh, move forward with full Medicaid expansion. And it had to be some kind of negotiations between Republicans and Democrats because there was some Republicans, uh, I want to say that Senator uh, Cummers, um, from uh, yeah, Senator Summers sorry, and, and, uh, and Senator Brass actually voted for it. But what happened is that I think the communications in the deal broke down because you don't bring up a vote in a, in, in a committee unless you feel you have the votes. And so what happened is leader Gloria Butler has always been defiant, saying, hey, we want to fully expand Medicaid. And it was very clear, they said this publicly, if you give us a hearing and a vote, a full vote in the Senate and a hearing and pass in the chamber, the Democrats agreed that then they would return the favor by voting for the CON bill. Well, they did that. And so the deal that I'm hearing from my sources is that they were supposed to get it out of committee, have a floor vote, have a hearing, and move it to the House. That did not happen. And some of the Republicans that I think were in on the deal actually ended up voting uh, against it. And then you had an ex officio member who was brought in to basically give them the votes to actually uh, table it. So let me say this. I think Democrats, and I know that leaders in the Senate, particularly Leader Butler, are still fully committed to fully expand Medicaid in Georgia. I, think, I, I can't speak for all Republicans, but I know that Democrats are still locked in on doing that. There's lots of behind the scenes <laughs> stuff going on here, Janelle, I feel yes, it. Yes, <laughs> there is. Um, I'm actually really torn on this. So I'm not, I'm not a lobbyist, I'm, not the pol I'm a political, but I'm not, right? So this is where I stand on this. I think that we have to educate our constituent base about what Medicaid is. Um, a lot of times we get it mixed up. We think that Medicare and Medicaid is the same thing. It's not. Medicare is definitely something that supports seniors. Medicaid is low income communities and people that are disabled. While I do think that people who are disabled, particularly if you get disabled on the job, you should be able to get some type of relief or some type of support because of, uh, to, to expect the business to sustain you for an entire year is going to be extremely um, difficult. However, we have about 90 million people right now and this is, this is as of 2022. So we have about 90 million people who are on Medicaid. That's 90 million people that are under the government's insurance. That's really what it is. It's basically saying that the government is taking care of me. The government determines who my doctor is. The government determines where I go, when I can go, how much I pay, everything. At the end of it all, we have to look at whether or not we want that much government involvement into, in our medical decisions. And that's where we have some challenges. Um, right now, we have about 1.1 million medical doctors that in 70% of them, so that's 770,000 doctors that are actually treating this 90 million people. So if we expand it, are we gonna increase our doctors? Like how do we ensure that you're gonna get actual quality health care when they're seeing 20 and 30 people a day? So I just think we gotta have a deeper discussion around if this is really benefiting the people long term. Can I get it in 30 seconds? Go ahead. <laughs> well. The Pathways program is not successful. 90% of the money that's been spent on Pathways has been going to administrative and consulting costs. You want to see that flipped around with 80 to 90% of the money actually going to medical services. So that program has not succeeded. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. Coming up, state lawmakers look to tackle prison reform after reports the system is in crisis. We'll discuss next. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel.
After an in-depth investigation by the AJC, state senators are now looking into prison reform and trying to improve a system that many say is in crisis. The AJC reports prison homicides are at record levels as staffing remains critically low. A seven-member committee will study the issue and report the findings to lawmakers for the 2025 legislative session. Janelle, to you first on this issue as you sit on the board for the Department of Corrections. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, it's funny, right before this, we were talking about making sure that we highlight a well-rounded view of what's really happening here. Um, so last year there was 38 homicides, which is a lot because no life should be uh, lost by any means, but it's 38 homicides out of 50,000 inmates. Um, we had 38,000 inmates obtain their career um, technical and training uh, uh, certificates as well. So the fact that we're not talking, we're talking about the 38 who were, um, who died in, as far as homicide, in the course of the entire year with 50,000 inmates, when we have 74% of our inmates are violent. We have to keep in mind, these individuals are in prison, so they're not in your neighborhood, they're not in your home, they're not in your backyard. And while I, I, I absolutely am not minimizing any life that has been lost, I do not want to come off like I'm minimizing it. And yes, we are working around the clock to make sure that we address that. We just cannot lose sight of the fact that we have 38,000 um, individuals who are going to be able to leave prison or be able to, to advance themselves um, going forward. So I just want to make sure we have a complete picture. But what about the crisis in the staffing? Right. I mean, you've got well, to get everywhere. raises. Right, but you've got to give <laughs> these everywhere. folks, you've got to give these folks raises. I mean, right. making $10, $15 an hour when you can make that at a fast food restaurant so and talk, not be put in danger. So we talked about this a couple months ago. We talked about the staff needing raises. We also talked about the, the conditions. And I, and I wrote this in my column in Georgia Train. I said, and I did this last November, so this is how long we've been talking about this issue. But being sentenced to incarceration should not mean being sentenced to a conditions that are inhumane, cruel, and full of violations of constitutional rights. That's essentially what's happening in our Georgia prison system. The other thing I said was, we need to focus more on rehabilitation and treating inmates as humans deserving of dignity and respect and not in a only moral and also makes people feel safer and their families feel safer. Think about it. I personalize this. I had an uncle who went to jail for 38 years. He developed so many health conditions while in jail and now he's living a productive life and so we have turned a blind eye on this crisis and I want to commend this this committee that's made up of Republicans and Democrats to come together and finally, finally holding this department accountable and making sure that we deal with this crisis that's in our prisons. And it's a Senate committee. Go ahead, Phil. Well, I'm glad, but I've been talking about this for years no, really? on the game. Well, that's not how I and, like it. Just and, uh, yeah. yeah. No, and so I was hoping more, to your point, that. Lori, would have been done during the legislative session. Uh, bigger raises. Uh, I'm sick and tired of these drones. Uh, hats off to the sheriffs and deputies in these rural counties that actually are finding, they're pulling over cars with drugs and they're finding drones that are going into the prisons. Uh, hey, if I, I was the warden, let's try to shoot them down. But anyhow, also, and this this kills me, and I hope a bipartisan Georgia congressional delegation works on trying to get the cell phones blocked. In the federal prison system, you can block cell phones. It is stupid that we cannot block cell phones here in our own prison system. Good point. I want to move on because amendments to a student athlete mental health bill were a surprise to many as Republican supporters say they're just trying to protect female athletes. But the legislation prevents males from participating in female sports. Um, Melita, the amended bill would also prohibit schools from allowing individuals to use restrooms and locker rooms that are different from their biological sex. This is a prime example of stripping a bill. No cigars, no overpriced champagne, no brass poles. They just totally stripped the bill, added all these extra um, provisions to it to, to make what they call a, a Franken bill. And I personally hope that the House will reject these Senate overtures because it really um, is a violation of the original intent of that legislation sponsored by a freshman. Phil, what about the strategy here that they use to put these amendments on the bill? As long as I've been in uh, journalism, it's both parties have done this. I, I don't see a problem with it. It still has to pass the both chambers and be passed by the whole House. The, the problem is the Democrats, the last Supreme Court nominee by the Democrats couldn't even define a woman. I mean, I think we ought to have a policy where biological males and biological females are separated and I don't have a problem with that. I would think the vast majority of Georgians don't have a problem with it. Fair, you want a final word? Nope.
I'm, 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 I, I can take it. Yeah, Janelle? I don't mind taking it because I, I think it's interesting that we're having this talk. I don't think anyone on this panel believes that there are more than two genders, correct? I mean, I think we all agree there's only two genders. So He's not saying. This is, I mean, well, I, I'm just saying, I, I, I'm, we're all smart people, so we all know that. So I do think that we need to make sure that we look at this topic with clear eyes and make sure we understand that there's a male and a female. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. Coming up, winners and losers. Time now for the week's winners and losers. <laughs> All right, Theron, go ahead. All right, my first winner <laughs> is going to be Michael Thurman, the release of his new book, James Overthorpe, The Father of Georgia. Uh, James Magazine did a really good article on this, and I know that James Magazine is named after James Overthorpe. I also wrote about it in Georgia Trend, but I encourage everyone to go on Amazon and other places to read this book. Uh, I had to unlearn some Georgia history, and now I'm going to relearn it by reading this book. And then lastly, uh, we didn't talk about this, but City of Atlanta recently appointed a new Atlanta municipal clerk, uh, Corrine Alindo, and also shout out to Shay Campbell. I saw him at Houston's this week. He's a big fan of the show. All right, great. Phil. Well, I agree with you. Michael Thurman did a great research job on that. He is a winner. And um, I I've got a loser. In the Atlanta Journal-Constitution did this sob story on Friday of this uh, killer who was executed and it's all about his last meal and prayers and what a nice family man he was and blah 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 it doesn't get, hardly see anything about the victim uh, who was actually stalked he had his buddies uh, find her they raped her and then he just laid her on the ground and shot three shots into her and killed her uh, hardly any of that is in here I'm, I want to at least balance journalism on some of these stories Melita my loser is the United States Postal Service because despite a brand new facility at the Palmetto Distribution Center, packages all over the metro area are delayed and not traceable even when people have paid extra money to have priority packages sent. This needs to be fixed. And I saw Senator John Ossoff working on that yeah, issue. Yes. Center. Ah. All right, uh, my, my winner is um, Representative Patty Stenson. She was the lone Democrat who supported the uh, school choice or, or the school voucher, so shout out to her. Also, there's an event that I'm hosting with Let's Win for America Action. It's this Wednesday, Women Lead Right uh, uh, Georgia Tech is also supporting us and conserve the culture. You can go to lwfa.com slash bloom in order to RSVP. All right, we will leave it there, folks. Make it a great week. We will see you again next week. Bye-bye.